My name is Russ Townsend, and I'm very pleased to bring to you Jim B. Tucker, MD, who joined me to talk about his new book, Before, Children's Memories of Previous Lives, and his work at the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia. Jim Tucker is currently the Bonner-Lowry Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. He's also the Director of the Division of Perceptual Studies, also known as DOPS, at the University of Virginia, where he continues the legacy of Dr. Ian Stevenson, the founder of DOPS, who pioneered the study of spontaneous past life memories. Jim Tucker has numerous publications in a wide range of scientific and academic peer-reviewed journals, and he's given many, many spoken addresses to scientific, medical, and general audiences. And he's also made a number of TV appearances, including on Good Morning America, Larry King Live, and CBS Sunday Morning. So I felt very privileged and honoured to speak with him about his new book and his research into cases of the reincarnation type. Jim, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. And you're an absolute rock star when it comes to this sort of thing, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm a fanboy. How does it feel, uh, how do you feel uh, about the work that you and the people at DOPS do and the potential impact that this has um, on, on the world and the way that we see ourselves? Well, I, I guess I would say that it can have a lot of impact on an individual level. You know, I don't know that we're going to change Western thought, um, but more and more people are open to looking at, at these uh, areas of consciousness and, and you know the potential for understanding consciousness that may exist separate from the brain may continue on uh, after the brain dies. Uh, so that that's it's out there and we put our studies out there and then people make of them what they will. So so you don't see you don't think that ultimately um, the evidence that you've been uncovering and documenting in, in places like Irreducible Mind and, and moving towards um, the latest publication, Conscious and Unbound, that this sort of thing will not ultimately create a seismic shift in and, and, and basically bust open uh, the, the myth of physicalism. <laughs> Well, I, I like to say that I'll probably have to wait for my next lifetime for that to happen. But yeah. um, but, yeah. but I think, you know, sometimes um, things can take a long time. I, I think yeah. it'll take more than just the empirical work. I, you know, I think eventually there will have to be a um, sort of theoretical understanding, probably coming from physics and particularly quantum physics, that at least allows for these things and maybe requires them. And, you know, though I think there will eventually be kind of a day of reckoning where people recognize that physicalism is not accurate and that there is this consciousness aspect of reality that, that really thinks at the core. Um, and, and I think we'll get there, but I think it's going to take a good while. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the same thing. It's uh, probably not going to be in our lifetimes. These things will, yeah. I, I am thinking long term, like 100 yeah. years down the track or something like that, right? Yeah. 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 And I mean, that I can definitely see. And, and part of the way we contribute to that is, you know, when we publish our books or, or publish our cases and people learn about them growing up or, you know, as, as younger people, and then that affects their outlook as they then go into whatever professions they go into. And so over time, hopefully, more and more people will be willing to take a second look at this question of, of physicalism. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. The, the problem is um, once, once uh, you grow up in, in a certain atmosphere, uh, it, it, a philosophical, metaphysical atmosphere, it tends to get baked in and it's really, really hard to to change absolutely yeah or it gets baked out when they go to graduate school but you know again i mean it more of this is getting into the general zeitgeist and and you know over time i, I think that will make a difference yeah yeah absolutely okay so let um let's go back to uh the beginnings of your own personal journey mm. it's it it, it is like i suppose you're in a minority. It's an unusual pathway for a, a scientifically trained person to take. 
we're, we're dealing with a field here which is um, not seen as reputable um, and, and you do get a lot of crazy kind of people getting into this <laughs> kind of thing as well. It opens up a whole Pandora's box of speculation. Yeah. Um, so tell us, how, how did you get started in this yeah. field in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I would say I had, well, I guess we all have at least some interest in the question of life after death, but I, I would say that I had a mild interest in life after death or parapsychology or psychic abilities, those sorts of things early on, but, but just very mild. Um, so yeah, I mean, I went to medical school. I tr did my training in psychiatry and then went into private practice, uh, just did completely mainstream child psychiatry. And then when my wife and I got together, she's a clinical psychologist. She was open to and interested in things like reincarnation and psychic abilities and so forth. So, you know, that, that got me curious and, and also, uh, um, in a way that's a little hard to describe, but our relationship kind of opened me up in general to to things that you know, I've been sort of shut you know blinders on my narrow path and then they yeah. kind of opened me up uh, so anyway I started doing reading about a variety of things and and including Ian Stevenson's work right um, so I, I just in private practice I wasn't feeling completely fulfilled in it so having a little hobby on the side um, seemed interesting and we saw in the local paper that uh, Bruce Grayson and Ian Stevenson had gotten a grant to do a new study on near-death experiences so I just called them up to see if they needed help interviewing patients and uh, you know one thing kind of led to another but you know when I had the opportunity I came on here full-time and, and started out as an hour a volunteer a week and then it you know, eventually became full-time in 2000 um, but when I did it I when I made that move and, and I continue to do a lot of clinical work. I mean, see patients and so forth. But when I made that move, I thought, um, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back into private practice. I'm going to try to do the work I want to do. So, you know, that has involved this work with past life memories, which um, certainly still holds my interest. So I enjoy doing it. It must be really fascinating as well. But when you first got into it, did, did you feel that this might be a kind of uh, a problem in the sense of, you know, putting yourself in a position where you won't be taken seriously by other academics or they'll start to think you're a bit of a quack or whatever. Yeah, well, again, I wasn't an academic when I okay. came into it. So, I mean, I, but yes, I mean, keeping a foot in both camps has been, you know, to some extent a strategy because certainly people here, they know that I'm, uh, qualified child psychiatrist and so we interact on a clinical level and then if people I mean a lot of people don't even know about this work but you know if people do they at least know I'm a credible person um, so that that's of some comfort to me that um, you know they don't all think I'm Looney Tunes so um, but you know the other thing you have to be true to yourself and you know we do the work in a serious minded way that um, that, you know, it's an exploration for me. I mean, I, I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm trying to find out stuff. Yeah. So it's an exploration. It's one I take seriously and, and you know, I stand behind the, the work that I do. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that struck me when I read um, Ian Stevenson's work, uh, and which I, th I think can be a little hard to convey to people, you know, mm -hmm. how to distinguish between someone who is being scientifically rigorous in their approach to documenting uh, what well, their work um, and, and and people who are a little bit more you know take a bit more liberty in, mm -hmm. in, in their work as well and um, how can you how, how, how would you advise people to uh, be able to distinguish between whether the whether what they're reading is of a scientific quality or is it or whether it's a bit you know a bit flaky well i think you have to look at um i'm mean, sorry of the attitude i mean you know with this work is looking at spontaneous cases we're not it's not controlled laboratory experiments so it, in that sense it's it's kind of a different kind of science but it it's um again a scientific approach where um, 
we're sort of critically minded as we look at at it all. I mean, we're open minded, but we're also, yeah. you know, I'm I'm looking at things, looking for the potential weaknesses in in a case or or yeah. you know with a study or whatever. Um, because again, I'm I'm not here to convince people of things. Um, I mean, sometimes I guess I am, but I mean, I'm I'm mainly trying to determine as best as I can what's happened in a case or, or the quality of the evidence. And, and that's yeah. certainly the approach that Ian always took as well. Yeah, that's that's what struck me is, is he's, yeah. he's not he's clearly not trying to push an agenda. He's looking at all of the different options and so forth. Yeah. And is, is very rigorous about the whole approach. So yeah. I suppose that really it comes down. The devil's really in the detail when it comes to understanding the scientific nature of something. You actually have to read it and understand what's going on. Um, uh, yeah, and and, yeah. and I mean, you don't take anything for granted if you don't have to. I mean, if you can double check what somebody tells you, then you double check it. I mean, you know, there are times where you're not able to, but um, um, as much as you can, you do. So, you know, you, you get other witnesses or you call up people and check on the facts and, and um, try to make it as airtight as you can. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now, w would you mind giving us a, a quick overview of... Uh, the work at DOPS, uh, the Division of Perceptual Studies. It's, it's not just about cases of the reincarnation type, but it does other things as well, right? Well, that's right. So Bruce Grayson is here and, and he's uh, one of the world's leading experts on near-death experiences. He's, he's spent decades studying them. Um, we have, you mentioned Ed Kelly, and you know he's got the um, lab, the uh, the um, neuroimaging lab, uh, particularly looking at EEGs of, of people uh, doing or attempting to do um, psychic tests or, or tasks of one sort or another. Um, we've got Kim Penberthy who's looking more at um, effects of meditation and, and um, including whether that affects people's abilities to have psychic experiences and that kind of thing. Um, looking at a variety of other kinds of unusual experiences that people have and, and trying to uh, create a database for those. So yeah, we've got a lot of different things going on. Very, very interesting work. And, uh, and, and your latest book, when I had a bit more of a look at that, I realized, oh, it's actually, it's actually your two previous books, um, which I'll just, um, I'll just read out the title. So mm -hmm. in 2008, you had uh, Life Before Life. And then in 2015 was um, Return to Life. And this latest book that's come out uh, just this year, just in April this year, I believe, um, is called Before, um, in uh, in juxtaposition to uh, Bruce Grayson's book After, uh -huh. <laughs> which is a nice touch. Uh, <laughs> but so it's really those previous two books combined, but then also updated. So what what is is really new in in your latest book? Yeah, yeah. So it's basically yeah, two in one edition. Uh, of the previous ones. The new part of actually is the introduction. So in, in the introduction, um, I kind of include some overview, but also include a new case. Uh, and it was one of a child remembering the Vietnam War, uh, remembering a life in the Vietnam War, which I think is quite an intriguing case. So, mm. yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. What, what's so intriguing about that particular case? Well, I mean, some of the details he gave in the specifics. Mm -hmm. So he, um, in fairly short order, said that he had been killed in an explosion in 1969 when he was 21 years old. So and how he old gave, was he when he made this report? Sorry? Uh, five. Yeah. So he was five and he started talking about these things already. Yeah. And yeah. He, he gave a last name in the state where he was from. And when the mom looked him up, she found out, by God, there was somebody with that name who was killed in Vietnam in 1969 when he was 21 years old. Uh, and it's an unusual name. So she then wrote to me and, and I did various research on this fellow that he had named. So when I went to visit him, um, I took along with me pairs of pictures where one picture was from this guy's life and the other one was a control picture uh, to see if he could pick out the correct one. And, and it was things like uh, a house or um, a school, the high school. And, um, and then, uh, um, other pictures from yearbooks and family. So, so anyway, to sort of get to the punchline, uh, I showed him eight pairs of pictures. Uh, two of them he didn't make a selection on, but for the others, he was six out of six. So, um, 
you know, that's pretty impressive stats. Uh, so the, you know, the odds of against chance that there's one out of 64. Uh, yeah. So that certainly can, you know, along with some dead on details, um, that that sort of testing certainly strengthens the the uh, the evidence in the case. Did, did he make uh, numerous statements um, that matched up to the individual as well? Uh, he did, although they were fairly general and, and a lot of, the, you know, things talking about a gun or being on the beach or in trenches and so forth. So that part, you know, we weren't able to verify details of, uh, again, yes. beyond the, the name, the state, his age when he was killed, uh, where he was killed, the year. Uh, so those are basically the ones that we could verify.